Okay. Well, so I can remember um, back when I was uh, a real little fellow, littler than today, um, and I was about three or four, and I, I remember discovering um, the, the television set and the screens on a television set. I would sit really close to these screens, and I discovered that there were these three little dots that were repeated over and over on these television screens. They were green and blue and red. And even as a little guy, I was really fascinated with this idea that these three screens, uh, these three dots repeated over and over and over on our television screens could give us this full range of colors that made up all of the shows uh, that we watched. And, and I remember one day my grandmother uh, saw me doing this and she got really agitated. She said, get away from there. The, the, you're sitting too close to the TV screen. It's going to make you go blind. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that uh, at some point or another. Okay, so it, it turns out that that's an urban legend. Uh, there's no truth to this. You can sit as close to your television set as you would like without going blind, um, it turns out. And, and it's, it's um, you know, memories like that that really kind of drove a lot of my interest in my research career. I've been very fascinated with this idea about what it is about new technology and new media that, that kind of frightens us as a society when these uh, new technologies get uh, introduced uh, to us. So um, there are a couple sort of universal truths uh, to the introduction of new technology in society. One is that usually new technology is going to make things better. Two, usually you won't think so uh, when it's beginning to happen. Three, you would not go back to a time before this technology existed, even if you think you would like to, and even if you had a time machine that you could actually do it with. And four, you can see these patterns repeated throughout history for at least 2,500 years, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks who complained about things like the alphabet uh, and such as being corrupting uh, to society. So thinking for a moment about things like smartphones and cell phones. So how many of you, I'd like to see a, sh a show of hands for this. How many of you believe uh, that cell phones are making people ruder, uh, we have less etiquette, we're less polite to each other. How many people think that that is the case for uh, cell phones damaging society in this way? Okay, so a fair number of people uh, think this. How about laziness? Are cell phones making us lazy? Are we writing fewer notes, not hanging out, not hanging out outside enough, or spending too much time on plants versus zombies or things like that? Okay, okay. How about just in general, how many people fear that cell phones and smartphones are just ruining the fabric of society as we know it? in general. Okay, so a few people even think that. Okay, that's great. So of the people who raise their hands for any one of those three questions, how many of you have a cell phone in your pocket or on your person today? <laughs> okay, so, and, and it's interesting because we see this weird dichotomy, right, between uh, we, as we adopt technology into our lives, we're, we also are afraid of it changing us in ways that we can't predict. So we see this kind of weird dichotomy in the way that we treat media in, um, you know, in, our, in our society or new technology in our society. If I, by the way, I have a cell phone in my my pocket, and it's continuing to buzz as I'm talking the whole time. So I, I, I totally am uh, sympathetic. Now, the funny thing is, is that these particular items I just asked you about, about smartphones and cell phones, are exactly the same things people were worried about with the regular old phone going back about 100 years ago. People were really upset about the introduction of the regular phone into society, believing that this was going to make us ruder, it was going to damage etiquette, people were going to start calling each other on the phone to invite them over for a party instead of writing a note. And of course, these things happened. <laughs> Some of these things actually did happen, but they didn't ruin society necessarily. Okay, we've we've kind of coasted along just fine. So it, again, it shows you the extent to which, at one point in time, people can be really upset about a new form of technology, but eventually, as society kind of adjusts to it, things turn out to be, for the most part, uh, all right. So let me ask you a little bit about another form of technology that's been introduced in the last couple of decades in video games. Okay, so how many people here believe that violence in video games contributes to violence in society, youth violence, criminal behaviors, things like that. Again, a show of hands for people who believe this. So a, a few people uh, believe this, okay? Um, of the people who raised your hands, how many of you have played a modern commercial video game in the last year? And Farmville does not count, um, by the way. Okay, a few, so uh, it's interesting with those types of questions, you 
you tend to see a discrepancy. And what you tend to see is that the people who are most afraid of video games, who are most afraid of violent content and things like that, tend to be older adults who don't use video games very often. And so it highlights that fears of technology and fears of media tend to function along generational lines, uh, very predictable generational lines. Okay? So, and and uh, along these lines, too, I wanted to ask, how many of you believe that youth violence today is, uh, is going up, that, that kids today are out of control, things are getting worse than ever as opposed to staying the same uh, or going down? Show your hands again with this. Okay, you're all starting to get skeptical of my questions. I think uh, by this point. All right, so we'll we'll come we'll come back to this uh, this issue in in just a little bit, but. Um but we can look back through history and see some of these examples of fears of technology, some of which, when we look back, we kind of think that these are almost comical. These are almost ridiculous to some extent. And, and one of these are fears uh, in the 19th century. We can see that there were people who were afraid of the introduction of the locomotive, of the train, uh, into society. And at the time, people were concerned that for people who were riding trains, that being on these trains and going fast, traveling all of 45 miles an hour, uh, was going to smash human bodies into jam. Uh, or that the air rushing past the passengers' faces was going to be going too fast, that they would not be able to take breath, and they would suffocate uh, on uh, the trains. And some of you are kind of laughing a little bit at that, but they took this very seriously. And you have to understand that nobody had traveled that fast uh, before. People were limited by the speed of a horse and such. So this was the introduction of something very new that was changing society, and people were worried about about it. Perhaps a bit more recent that some people can relate to uh, is back in the 1980s, people were concerned about the lyrics in a lot of rock music and pop music and rap and things like that. So a lot of occult references, violence, sexual references. The Senate held hearings about this stuff that resulted in this sticker that you may be familiar with, some of you, that you know, warns you that the content in the music you are buying might be explicit. And this sticker probably sells more CDs in music than it actually with, uh, you know, prevents people from uh, buying. But when they were he holding hearings about uh, the content of lyrics and music, some of the bands that they uh, targeted included Cyndi Lauper. Uh, and she, one, she has a song, Shebop, uh, that was on the Senate's list of the Filthy 15. And it turns out that Shebop is a masturbation reference. And so the U.S. Senate was worried that Cyndi Lauper was going to send teens running out into the streets masturbating. <laughs> As if they needed Cyndi Lauper to help them with that, by the way. <laughs> And then Alice Cooper is a good example as well, who's well known for including horror themes, occult themes, violence, and he, he decapitates himself on stage. Um, and, I, and I happened to be at an Alice Cooper concert about a year ago here in Orlando, and I remember looking around the crowd and thinking to myself that the average age of the people at an Alice Cooper concert in 2015 was about 104. <laughs> And there again, it kind of goes to show you the extent to which uh, what people are afraid of at one point in time becomes perfectly acceptable at another point in time. People are not really worried about Cyndi Lauper causing teen pregnancy anymore, or uh, Alice Cooper causing teens to become devil worshippers or things like that, right? These are classics uh, at this point in time. So. Back to this issue of video games, by the way. Um, the truth of this is that we are consuming more violent video games than we have in the past. And you, in this graph here, the red line going up is basically our consumption of video games adjusted for the violent content uh, in those games. And you can see that over the past few decades, we're, we're consuming a lot more violent video games than in the past. What's interesting, however, is that as represented by the blue line going down, youth violence has decreased uh, substantially over the same time period. In fact, in fact, youth violence is down by over 80% uh, from what it was in 1993, during the same time period in which we're consuming uh, violent video games. So this is correlational data, of course, uh, but it is pointing out that you know, our, our fears of uh, the content in video games and other media are, are just not matching the data that we're seeing in society. It's not having the kind of impact on society uh, that some people uh, were really afraid of. Now, occasionally technology does go wrong. Uh, I don't want to be entirely Pollyannish about this type of stuff, okay? But for the most part, these are the exceptions. And it tends to be for fairly big things like nuclear power that things can occasionally go wrong, okay? Uh, so most of our fears about technology have not turned out to be something to actually uh, worry about. And what we seem to see are a couple of phenomena, a couple of biases, a couple of cognitive biases that tend to influence our fears about media. One is something that I call nostalgia 
bias. Nostalgia bias is our tendency to look back on our past and think that they were a lot better than they actually were and such. So we tend to remember the positive aspects of our past and forget the negative. So we kind of look back on our childhood and our teenage years and think that everybody was kind of holding hands and, and singing songs in a circle and cooperating and being peaceful with each other. And we forget things like polio uh, or the Vietnam War uh, or three channels of crap on television. That was all we had to choose from. So we kind of think we'd like to go back to these things, but if we really thought it through, uh, we probably wouldn't. The other is uh, a thing that I call the Goldilocks effect. And the Goldilocks effect is the tendency for every generation to think it got media and technology just right. And the generation of people that came before us, our parents, our grandparents, well, they were just sticks in the mud. They weren't cool. They didn't get it. They didn't understand good music. They couldn't figure out how to use remote control. So we don't need to listen to them. But these kids that are coming after us, they're, they're out of control. They don't have boundaries. They're listening to this weird stuff that we just don't understand. Uh, you know. So we, ha we always have the sense that our level of technology, our, level, our media consumption is exactly what everybody should do. And what's interesting is you can look back through history for 2,500 years and see every generation do exactly the same thing in this respect. Every generation thinks it got everything exactly the way it ought to be, which is kind of interesting. Now, these uh, fears of technology do come with some real potential costs to them. Uh, one of them is misinformation. Uh, so a classic example of this, of course, are things like fears of vaccines, the idea that vaccines can lead to autism. And those types of fears can cause real damage if uh, parents are not vaccinating their kids and either their kids or the kids that are playing with them get exposed to dangerous illnesses and such. Um, a second pro possible problem is that fears of technology can destroy us from real issues in society. The more time we spend worrying about violence in video games uh, as an impact on crime, the less we're talking about real causes of crime, like poverty, or educational disparities, or mental health reform, or things like that. And the third issue is, of course, our fears of technology simply prevent us from having fun. Um, the more time that we worry about something that we might adopt into our lives, the less chance we get to actually interact uh, with that thing. So we can actually shoot ourselves in the foot a little bit with our own fears. Um, and the, the reality, the kind of the concluding idea I'd like to leave you with is that technology is not good or bad. Technology is not evil or good. It really comes down to technology is a, is a tool, and we decide how we use it in our own lives, and we need to take responsibility for that. And if things go right, or if things go wrong, that is on us, and it's not something that we should be blaming the technology for. So thank you very much for listening to me today. Thank you.